ourself a Catwoman Zoe Kravitz is lining up for Matt Reeves' movie. We've got a full spoiler review of the Joker. Full spoilers. Go see it. Come back. Watch the review because it's going to be spoiler tastic. But wait. We also have some Kevin Feige news. Breaking news during the intro graphics. We are going to have to parse out what these titles mean and just maybe make things up about what they mean because that's basically all we can do with this information. Aren't all titles made up? I mean, they are a little. <laughs> as, as Thor might say, all words are made up. All words are made up. Joining Welcome. us today for Made Up Words. As Thor might say, are they? <laughs> What's up, breaking news? I can't wait. I'm happy to be back on the show talking about all this stuff. Looking forward to it. Let's get it on. Yeah, it's Collider Heroes number 327. And first off, we heard just this morning that Kevin Feige has received a promotion. Yes. Uh, he is the chief creative officer for Marvel. Now, I'm parsing my words very carefully there because Marvel has a lot. It's like Hydra in that it has many arms. Mm -hmm. uh, it is unlike Hydra in many other ways, but uh, <laughs> it has a lot of different branches. And we're, I'm very curious what this means exactly because he has been the head of Marvel Studios, which a few years ago was moved away from Marvel Entertainment, the comic book publishing side that we all are familiar with, mm -hmm. and under the direct authority of Disney. Okay, timeline. Mm -hmm. Disney's a company, Marvel's a company, Marvel has a lot of adventures, goes bankrupt, get bought, all kinds of stuff happens. But they're an independent comic book company with, uh, who licenses out their stuff until, whatever, circa 2009, mm -hmm. 8? Mm -hmm. When did the actual purchase happen? Uh, oh. The first three films were on their own, yeah. so it would have been 2010? Yes. Because it was after Iron Man 2, mm -hmm. right? Timeline sound right? 2010-ish? Sounds, right. sounds it, right. It, it, sometime around when like, they made they announced the slate of post-Iron Man films, but before Avengers came out, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so between 2010 and 2012 in that case. Disney buys Marvel. Uh, Marvel has uh, created their own filmmaking arm called Marvel Studios. Uh, that's all operating under Disney, but a different guy named Ike Perlmutter is the head of Marvel. Mm -hmm. Now, a few years into that relationship, they move Kevin Feige and his arm of the empire over to Disney proper, mm -hmm. which owns both, so for them it's all the same, but is interesting for us as comic book fans because now Marvel is two units. Just to be clear, this is a 30-minute show, Amy. So okay. <laughs> go ahead, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. So there's these things called movies. Uh, whiteboard of Justice. Uh, yeah, uh, let's go. Let's go. I need a, a, the question are, style I like conspiracy board. Yeah, yeah. Because it's what's so interesting about this news for me um, is that since that time, because everybody's just going at once, comic books keep doing their thing, movies keep doing their thing, TV exists in this sort of weird third category, mm -hmm. where Marvel TV, headed by Jeff Loeb, does a bunch of other stuff. But no more. That's the thing. So someone sum up, like, today's announcement is that Feige now has direct authority creatively mm -hmm. over all of those Marvel branches. Yep. If Dorian was here, he'd be very upset, because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. got canceled for a reason. Yeah. Like, the one above all is now Kevin Feige. He, mm -hmm. he is TV, he is film. It looks like he's going to be other branches of entertainment, not comics, I assume, mm -hmm. but it he seems He has like oversight over the entire thing, including technically creative direction for comics, according to the structure they're laying out. Now, all of the comic book leadership is still in place. Right. They are probably going to carry on with business as usual, mm -hmm. but technically, creatively speaking, they now answer to Kevin in a way they did not before. Now, mm -hmm. on games mm -hmm. and licensing and other elements of what Marvel Comics, as we know it, they're called Marvel Entertainment, but I'm going to keep saying Marvel Comics because it's already confusing. Uh, they are going to probably carry on doing business as usual. In gaming and licensing and, and events and some mm -hmm. of the other partnerships and things, they still report to Ike Perlmutter, head of Marvel, uh, in that way. President of Marvel, I want to say. But, but Kevin Feige doesn't report to Ike. He, he reports to Alan no. Horn. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? So Kevin uh, reports to Disney. Right. And Joe Quesada is still there. C.B. Sabolsky is still there. So mm -hmm. that's still comics. All the rest of that is still in place. So I don't know what Ike does. And that's okay because I don't like a lot of his decisions. Right. Well, I think they're only getting, like, I think things that are running, they're running, going to run as they are now. Mm -hmm. What's going to change is that Feige is in the room to at least consult and if and guide if need be. Uh, it doesn't mean he everything will have to pass through Kevin and Kevin decides who gets in. And who, no, it's more He's a not matter of uh, lining up freelancers for the backup stories it, in the next Thor exa annual. Exactly. I mean, he probably could if he decided to, but I, I, he probably already could have done that if he wanted to make that phone call. I guess so. Uh, but that Sony guy told me he was really busy. So maybe <laughs> I don't know. So you look at the situation and to me, this just means that, look, they saw what Kathleen Kennedy did with Star Wars, right? They mm -hmm. handed everything to Kathleen Kennedy and she said that stuff's legends doesn't exist. All this is canon. Comic books, video games, everything. So they see the way that worked and the cohesiveness of that. Now, you can argue the results of those films all you want. It's irrelevant. 
It's what they like. The fact that one person is in charge of the direction of everything. So I think they saw that model and they want and they move Kevin into that position. I also think let him do the Star Wars movie and giving him this as a way to placate Kevin more than anything else. <laughs> and Please maybe, don't get bored and leave. Yeah, exactly. And maybe even line him up to slide into Iger's spot at some point down the road. That is certainly possible. So I think just all this means is that Kevin is deciding the direction of a lot of the Marvel stuff. And because of his 10 year track record, yeah. I think they see that this is a positive move overall because there's been all kinds of rumors about him moving to other places or switching to other places. This is the way to lock Kevin down and he's in charge of film and TV and who knows? I don't have a problem with this because I think now having TV connect up to the film can remove that irritating aspect of having to enjoy the Marvel Netflix shows but know that they don't really line up to the right. movie. So all of that, uh, uh, we don't know how long this is going to be for the Disney Plus, those shows, but it certainly means that Kevin will be, um, how can I say this? Kevin will be the person who decides the direction of those kinds of things. Comic books, I don't I don't know how much you'll have say in that video games a little more say i'm sure but the film and tv stuff is where he's going to focus the most and that i think is a positive overall have one person in charge of it all so what you're saying is he's good at wearing many hats that's what i'm saying yes uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and i think the like the i did the vr experience yeah. and it's it's like side canon it's really cool mm -hmm. because it takes place within the mcu to the point where you're an avenger effectively it's so cool you go into the world of the movies and you get to experience it in a way that i've never done because i've never done vr so mm -hmm. i think having kevin feige in this position will allow more things to be like that, where it's yep. a new format, a new medium, but within the universe that he's built. And I mean, as far back as 2000s X-Men, he's the guy that got Wolverine's hair right. So My it's, favorite yeah. anecdote that of like trust in Feige. So 20 years, because mm -hmm. that was released in 2000, which means that moment probably happened in 99. So for two decades, Kevin Feige has given us great comic book content. Yep. So for me, Anyone that's concerned, I think this is the best possible move because it gives us one voice, one direction, and that's a very positive one. Yeah, and to answer Amy's point, he's going to, according to Deadline, he's going to continue to report to uh, Alan Horn and to Alan Bergman, uh, but he is here's how the reporting structure will line up right now. Under Kevin Feige, Dan Buckley will continue as president of Marvel Entertainment, where Ike Perlman remains as chairman. So all of that stays in place. It's just that, you know, he's over Kevin's here. in the room. That's what it means. <laughs> Kevin's in a lot of rooms is what it means. And I think, uh, like we said, I think it's overall not a bad idea, but mm. Amy is right to be like, well, who, what gets changed? What doesn't get changed? I think we'll see down the road, but I think they want everything like synergy. They want every, if the character is going to do this in the comic book, they want it to line up to a degree in the uh, video game and, and then in the movie. Yeah. So we are I, seeing the positive benefits of, of seeding people who care about that stuff in the right places. Yeah. Like Bill Roseman over at Marvel games mm -hmm. uh, works. He came out of the comic book side as an editor on those books. And I think it shows because a lot of the Marvel games and the mobile games and things, they are infused mm -hmm. with authenticity and the spirit of the comics in a way that I really appreciate. Yeah. And I feel like having the right people at those key positions makes that happen. Mm -hmm. And if Kevin Feige was a random movie guy and they handed him the keys to Marvel <laughs> with influence over the comics, I'd be terrified. Yeah, sure. But he's not a random guy. He's Kevin Feige. Right. So I'm pretty excited. I think his obsession with the material is only going to make things better the more power he has. And mm -hmm. I rarely am like, give someone more power. But give Kevin Feige more power. <laughs> he's earned it. Like when you earn a promotion, you earn a promotion. So right. 20 years, the man should oversee everything. Obviously, we all hope that there there's no like baby with the bathwater effect in terms of the like the wonderful people who've done work. You know, we are big runaways stands, and oh, that yeah. has been its mm. own thing under Marvel TV, which has done great work. So hopefully, I'm just gonna cross my fingers that all the people who do the work I love get to keep doing it in some new form that is a little more coherently organized. Yeah. Much like Deadpool making nearly a billion dollars twice. I don't imagine that they're going to look at that and be like, nah, like the same with <laughs> Runaways. Like it's done very well for Hulu. I can't imagine he's going to be like, it wasn't my idea. I feel like it's going to do very well under that leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're, we're in for a great phase four, five, six, 17, 97. <laughs> yeah. And if, speaking of being in for exciting things, I am completely on board for our new Catwoman. Y'all, we have another Catwoman coming and it is Zoe Kravitz. Uh, what do you think? I, I mean, it makes so much sense. It was one of those announcements where I saw it and I was like, well, yeah, that, that, <laughs> sure. Yeah. She sure is Catwoman. Yeah. I think like, that's why I didn't burn up Twitter because I was like, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Like, they just moved on from yeah, it. Yeah, good call. Yeah, good call. <laughs> Robert Pattinson was like, oh, wait, I should have thought of that. And then controversy. Jonah Hill was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Different take. Mm. This was like, 
I can see the mask on her face. Like it just lined up. I agree. That's why Twitter wasn't crazy. Yeah. It was just math. Yeah. <laughs> a friend of the show, Kalinowski, was worried that people would come out and be uh, upset about a black cat woman. But I, I, and I responded back to him on Twitter and I said, no, because the history of cat woman has two different women, black women who've played it. I think yeah. she's been black as much as she's been white. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Eartha Kitt and Halle, Halle Berry. Berry. And now Zoe Kravitz counters uh, Lee we Merriweather, Michelle Pfeiffer, and uh, uh, Anne, Hathaway. Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. And I think there's another white cat woman in Batman the series, but I can't remember offhand in there my head. There was a third. So there was a third, and I can't remember what her name was, but yeah, all those. So there's a balance here. Julie Newmar, Catwoman, or Julie Batgirl? Newmar. That's yeah. it. Yep, good call. Then, then that's the uh, thing for Seven Brides, Seven Brothers. She's in that as well. That's not, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, we uh, always stop the show for old musical references. <laughs> yeah, always. Yeah, that's our rule. Say, she's really good in that. Full uh, outlaw moment. I just saw the snow down. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> so, but this, but the, I think that's why the collective consciousness didn't get all upset about it and actually was like, yeah, this makes the most sense because she's great. She's perfect age for what they mm -hmm. want to go for as well. And Zoe is building her career. And yeah. this is third generation. Some people were shocked that she's the daughter of Zoe Kravitz. I mean. And Lanny Kravitz uh, and uh, Lisa Bonet. But here's another one. She's also the granddaughter of Ro Roxy Roker from the Jeffersons. So this is legacy. <laughs> this is legacy, people. So Which I like means that there. Aquaman is her stepdad. That's right. Which, Which is so there, cute. Did there's you see no his... way they don't make a joke about that. He, he <laughs> sent the cutest Instagram post, I think, or, uh, or where he was just like, so proud of you. You're in the DC family. Oh, and like, oh. but they're shouting at his kid to me like, their sister is a cat woman. It was just the most adorable. She's also both Lego Catwoman and Mary Jane. That's She's right. very busy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Right. For me, it really works because I can totally see the intrigue and that really like sexy spy drama between the two of them. As weird as that sounds, like I can see Robert Pattinson and Zoe Kravitz having the bat and cat relationship. Mm. Oh, sure. As soon as this was announced, I was like, oh, I want to see that tension. I want to mm -hmm. see that flavor. And now this gives us like the idea of how this can shape out. Like I can't imagine Catwoman's going to be a small part now. Right. Now it's going to be a second lead. I hope so. I think that would be a lot of fun. And, mm. and what you were saying... I haven't personally seen a lot of negative reaction. It doesn't mean it's not happening. Sure, it, sure, sure. Like, uh, but it is funny. I would like, I would like us to be past that because I often think like we're definitely done with that. And then they cast the a fantasy series I love for Amazon that's being adapted, Wheel mm -hmm. of Time. Uh, like they did inclusive casting, and Twitter was a mess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's so every time I think we're really done with that, it turns out we are not completely done with that. So I'm just gonna cross my fingers that this time it's just like no, everybody's on board. Everybody remembers Eartha Kitt. This yeah. is a totally fine thing. Even if there wasn't precedent, she would be a rad pick for Catwoman. Let's get on board. I keep cultivating my Twitter, and I keep being like the world's better. I'm like, now you just muted everyone. <laughs> <laughs> like I just yeah. look at my list. I'm like, no, I just hid the monster. Yeah, I love, I love doing that. It <laughs> makes, it makes social media so much it's better a great experience. Week. To mute or block is such a better experience <laughs> on social media. Um, uh, one thing I want to say to you guys, and, and I want to walk the line of this carefully because I want to make sure it does not mean that because she's black, she has to be related. It's just an idea. Okay. Would it be interesting if they messed with the mythology of Batman a little bit and she, if Commissioner Gordon is black, she's Commissioner Gordon's daughter instead of Barbara Gordon. Would that be interesting? Maybe she's not Selena Kyle. Or if they said Alfred is black. Remember, they, they tied in Barbara Gordon to Alfred in that Schumacher Batman. They sure did. They yeah. sure tried. That is Which, a fact. For the record, I have still never finished watching. I really? will never finish watching you Batman and Robin. You gotta see the climactic nope. ending of that one. As soon as the motorcycle chase was over, I walked out of the theater. And I've never, <laughs> ever put it back on again. I mean, so I'm saying I really did. I can't did. believe you haven't seen the end of I Batman and Robin. I, I remember I was in Springfield Mall. I was on the aisle seat. I literally walked up said, fuck this. Walked on up. <laughs> oh, oh, excuse me. Sorry, sorry. So anyway. My board of justice. Yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble now. <laughs> Shoot. I'm in trouble now. We can everywhere. just tell you things happen yeah. in the end of that film, and you're not going to know. No, I'm not going to know. Because nothing could be weirder than what actually a... happens. It, exactly. It becomes <laughs> up when Jack Nicholson comes back from the dead. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't see that. Yeah. Good they point. all just explode two that, minutes before the ending and it goes completely black. It was a like whole choice. Boys crossover because yeah. Joel Schumacher's like, I made the Lost Boys. There's got to be vampires in this Batman movie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually crazy. But yeah. the opposite of that, theoretically, the Batman, a detective movie. Yeah. Uh, I think that this gives us even more credibility towards the type of film he's assembling. And I think we might get along Halloween like we keep talking about. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if you're fighting a bunch of villains, you need an anti-hero to team up with. Right. And I could easily see this being the cat and mouse game mm -hmm. of her having to help him yeah. and I'd love to see Zoe Kravitz in that role it is funny like th she's such good casting that like you Coy it makes me hope that this is a substantial part of the movie because mm -hmm. part of the problem with assembling a rogues gallery to be suspects is that a lot of them like Agatha Christie style you gotta introduce them quick and have them be mm -hmm. memorable background people yeah. and we're gonna be hungry for more mm -hmm. we're gonna want 
like especially with some of these characters if you're just like suspect number seven it's going to be a, a real roller coaster for us who live yeah. on these casting announcements to be like don't get too attached that person might not be a huge part of the film they're just going to memorably fill out that rose gallery when we get to the actual film it'll be fine unless we all love King, beautiful you know. background yeah unless it's condiment suspect King. number seven is condiment king he can be as big or small part as <laughs> he wants but i'm there for it but despite just giving the advice not to get too too, too attached to that i'm gonna immediately get attached because i think she's going to be a great cat woman and yeah. i hope we see a lot of her yeah yeah don't disagree <laughs> i'm i'm so excited for this movie like yep. the batman every every announcement gets me more ready so yeah give it let's make it mm-hmm. uh so they're filling out the cast for matt reeves's batman that's coming at us soon but coming at us even sooner is arrow season eight it is premiering tonight mm. and we got to talk to joseph david jones uh who was delightful check it out and we know, of course, that the, the universe created there is going to continue. No. Uh, and you get to be there for the, the big finale. Yeah. Uh, I, I just broadly, out of curiosity, <laughs> are you, as we as comic book fans are, excited for some kind of crisis on Infinite Earth? Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like the biggest crossover that's ever been done it's on insane. television history. And it's, it's huge for the network. <laughs> I don't know how much I can say about this, um, but like Mark, he went to Warner Brothers with like this this laundry list of things, and he was like, "I want this." Yeah, <laughs> and they're like, "All right, well, settle." Down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we can get Christian Bale. In this thing. <laughs> But we it need is. Ben Affleck, Christian Bale, <laughs> George Clooney, <laughs> Val Kilmer, and that. Michael Keaton. Yeah. God. <laughs> if we don't get Adam West, <laughs> then what are we doing? It's all the Warner Brothers lot just like looking at sound stages. Yeah. Like, mm, yes. We're going to need a time machine, Gotham. but we can do this. Yes, we yeah. will make this oh happen. God. I would like a Tupac laser hologram of Christopher Reeve. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Aww. laughs> So obviously that conversation was a blast. That's what I normally sound like. <laughs> You're doing so well. I'm so sorry. It's she just, was so great. I and couldn't like, let you out of this because I need to know what you think about things. I get it. I get it. <laughs> uh, I Can I say VR, the coolest? Oh, yes. Tell me more about this, by the way. But Because I know we got Polis and I know we got Joker, but the VR experience, the, the madness of what the Void and like the Marvel team built. Tell me what the Void is. So the Void is the company that, that runs the VR stuff. That mm-hmm. They did a Star Wars one, they did a Wreck-It Ralph one, and now they have a Marvel's Avengers. Uh, and it has so much canon that you've wanted to see in the movies, and so many... It feels like not just a deleted scene, but it feels like a deleted series of scenes that you're in. So it's like when you read those choose your own adventure goosebumps or like choose your own. You know a deleted series of scenes is a movie, right? No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. You know what? It was a deleted movie. I'm just saying. Also an unreleased you film. You starred in an Avengers movie, uh, basically, Avengers is what movie. I'm hearing, right? Yeah, I just got shut down by Amy Dowell No, air. I'm hyping so, you up. So it was a, an unreleased film uh, like New Mutants <laughs> that I got to experience. Yes. But it was really cool because there's so much of the voice cast and there's so many. I don't want to give a single thing away but the Avengers are with you and this is in the trailer so it doesn't give anything away you're wearing effectively a Wakandan Iron Man suit what Mm. so they have Shuri make a suit off of Stark tech and Wakandan tech and you wear it and I've never done VR so I know with Star Wars you're holding like a gun as a stormtrooper this somehow measures your hands without any sensors on them so you're doing this and it reads them all you have no gloves on (laughs) how it did that I'll never understand and you're doing stuff like Iron Man and it knows where your hands are and you're going through storylines, you experience, I, I, it's so hard not to give anything away, but it feels like you're in a comic book in a way that I thought movies had accomplished, but it goes another level. So if movies- I can't believe the, you ever came out. Did they I, just force you to leave They were eventually? like, sir, we're closed. And I was like, no, you're not. You're closed when I say you're closed. But it was like, um, if movies are the spaces between panels, this is the space between frames. So it's like that next evolution of being a part of a movie and you feel like a superhero and the extra sensory stuff's incredible. The storyline itself, you can tell is written by comic fans. Mm. You can tell the people that made this love the MCU and comics and everything about it is just so sweaty. Everything's just so nerdy and good. Um, and I, I would do it like five times in a row if they hadn't told me to leave, sir. Please, oh, politely. Uh, that so is fantastic. I'll be back in Anaheim. I'll be back on Third Street. I will be there often. It's incredible. And when you can't be there, you will be picking up some comic books because we have a pull list today. Ooh, hey, Amy, look at the smooth transition. <laughs> it's, just a, it's a real fun show today. Bam. Uh, <laughs> We are going to start out with an indie pick. Something is killing the children. Uh, number two is out this week. This is one you might have missed. First one's great. Uh, and we also have Absolute Carnage number four, the penultimate issue in one of my favorite miniseries in a long time. Ryan Stegman on art. Donnie Cates writing it, a powerhouse book. We have a brand new book calling back to 
one of my favorite pieces of DC history, we've got Superman Smashes the Clan, number one, which is exactly what it sounds like, a throwback to the Superman radio serial where he confronted the KKK and publicly embarrassed them, and you have to look this story up. It's the best. <laughs> it's just the best. I'm so excited they're doing this. What's up next? Our number four draft pick is X-Men number one, and this is a variant cover by one of my favorite artists in the game, Mark Bagley. I love this cover. I'm so excited for this book post Hox Pox. Mm. <laughs> We will get into Hawks and Pox on Giant Size, but you obviously need to be picking this one up. And also, you might want to know that hmm. the Critical Role comics, which are currently rolling along in monthly releases for Volume 2, they were digital only for their first run, and it is out in print at last today, uh, or tomorrow, depending on when you're reading this. On Wednesday, the Vox Machina Origins volume is available in shops for any of my D&D nerds who might not know that they can go get their hands on this. I love that Mercer Marisha and Talison are in a comic. Kind yeah. Of. Like that, that just makes me so happy. I it's, just... It's pretty great. Heart. Anything from there jump out at you, John? I think it's the uh, Superman versus the Klan. This is an awesome design and work, and I love the vibe of it. Kind of, you know, you know. Sometimes you look at something that it looks like, oh, that's for kids, but then you look at it, oh, no, no, that's for the kid inside of me. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like that's that kind of vibe looks fantastic. And the X Men number one. I'm like, uh, you know, Amy talks about this all the time. How many times can you renumber these things? But uh, you know, <laughs> but I I don't mind it. You know, when you're coming out with something strong like this, you're like, okay, good. Let me jump into this here because it's one. That means I can jump in here and see what's up. So we always remember, we, all of us have been wa reading these things for decades, but sometimes we forget there are new people coming up who are mm -hmm. just going to take a number one and go and run with it and want to start a new series, even though it's an old uh, uh, a team. So I'm down with it. Yeah, it's a really interesting moment because we're coming out of the 12-week Hickman event that uh, yeah. he oversaw with his wonderful artists that has just wrapped up. Shift on time, shocking all Amazing. of us. And not the shaded Marvel, shaded the entire comic book industry. That's literally never happened. Uh, <laughs> but it did. It all came out on time, which means we are ready for the no fewer than six, possibly up to eight or nine, depending on announcements, new X-Men books. But they start this week with X-Men number one. I'm so excited for new X-Men. I mean, I mean, you know what I mean? New X-Men. Yeah, I want to call it new X-Men. I'm so excited for a new round of X-Men because... Just going to confuse people. Um, That's uh, the yeah. informal name for the Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison, Jonathan Hickman's Comics. new X-Men 2019. <laughs> But I, I, too, that's my number one pick of the week just because I have no idea what it's going to be after Hawks Pox because that, that, that mini is just absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. I also realized that Mark Bagley, along with John Amita Jr., are probably the only two people I run from at cons. Uh, John Amita Jr. was at LA Comic Con, and I couldn't say hi to him. <laughs> Because like, there's something about artists from my childhood that I, I saw him and I was like, oh no. And I like scampered away. And I think Mark Bagley's the only other guy. It was guy. me trying to make words in front of Chris Claremont last year. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had to make two trips because I literally just bailed the first time. Uh, I was just like, eh, you, 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 thanks, bye. It might be for the best that I didn't know Brian K. Vaughn was at House of Secrets because I probably would have opened the door and been like, nah, and turned around. <laughs> <laughs> you made saga, can't. <laughs> Uh, so, meanwhile, it is time. If you have not yet seen a certain movie yet, mute us now, because from here on out, we are in the spoiler zone, and we are ready to talk the half a billion dollar making and no signs of slowing Joker. Uh, we are in full spoilers mode for Joker, which is making all the money at home and abroad, which I thought was a really interesting surprise for yep. this whole process. Yep. Uh, garnering mostly very positive reviews, uh, and we're ready to get into it, y'all. What couldn't you say last week, Coy? Uh, that the ending when he discovers the Joker is amongst my favorite Elseworld experiences I've had, period. Mm. In a comic, in a show, in anything, because this wasn't a Joker I've lived with before, and I loved that I spent, and I said this on our, our non-spoiler, but I can elaborate now. The first two acts, I was like, is it going to stick the landing where he feels like the Joker, or am I going to go, am I going to leave this movie like, well, Todd Phillips said it wasn't a comic movie, and there were hints of it, but by the time we got to the third act, to me, I could feel the fact that he was the Joker because the violence he chose felt like the Joker. The the lines of comedy he chose felt like the Joker. And ever since that that the stairway scene, even the way he ran changed. So when they got to the talk show, the choices in his violence and the choices of like kissing that journalist or the, the, the woman and like the way he, when he killed De Niro, all of that to mm. me was so trademark. I could see that animated. I could see that in a comic. I could see that with speech bubbles. And I was just so enthralled by the fact that I started this movie like, this is this beautiful, gritty 70s drama. And I didn't know how it would land there. But somehow in two hours, it got to the point where it was suddenly animated to me almost. And I was... I was so enthralled by the fact that it had become a comic book movie mm. that it, it's amongst my favorite comic films of all time. That's so awesome. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm gonna reveal. I'm gonna pull the curtain. Amy is struggling to say anything because she doesn't want to say anything negative about a film that she didn't 100 enjoy, and I totally respect that. And I would like to hear uh, what she thinks. Absolutely, because as much as we love it, I'm always I'm also aware of why people don't like it. And I think this is the biggest thing for me to say that it's empty bothers me. To say that it's lazy or it has nothing to talk about, I find that insane. I mm. think. Talk about their issues with the, if you have issues with the storylines, issues with some of the acting, fine. Those are things that I can understand. But with Joker, I enjoyed it for so many reasons. A, the score is incredible. It's otherworldly, mm. that score. Mm. Uh, I put it on the other day and I got really angry at the office, so I turned it off. Because it's that kind of, it's that kind it's of score. It's not walk-around music, John. You know, I know, it hits certain <laughs> notes and you're like, ooh. And so anyway, but the performances are incredible. And here's the thing. For everybody who's like, oh, Heath Ledger's Joker, Heath Ledger's Joker. There is, without throughout the film, rather, he's an un, the film itself is an unreliable narrator. We do not know what is real and what isn't real from the beginning, including the stuff with the mom. We don't know. Did she have sex with Thomas Wayne and have the kid and Thomas Wayne like had her committed because he's rich Which and powerful? It's plausible. It's plausible. Or did they not have sex and she is crazy and they and he did it for her good we don't know and so like the joker in dark knight he is giving you multiple possible origins for this person mm -hmm. and we don't know what to what to believe and what not to believe and at the end a lot of people say oh it glorifies the joker at the end because he's held up by those people how do you know that actually happened you don't and those people are unsavory people anyway so being liked by him doesn't make him a glorified hero in any way shape or form it makes him actually a worst person to be beloved by that riotous crowd and then at the end is when they finally get him to be the joker finally when he kills that psychiatrist and anybody who feels sympathy for the joker after that movie is insane he is a terrible terrible person yes did he have origin story that was possibly induced by a physical attack as a child yes did he was he brought up in a world that was uncaring and unfeeling yes but he also chose to react to it in this way he was not an unwilling victim that went along with it he says himself i felt never more alive than killing and I don't feel bad, and I'm tired, and with Robert De Niro, he says that, I'm tired of feeling bad or acting a certain way that I'm supposed <laughs> to act because society wants me to act this way. I don't want to act this way, this is who I am. He's an evil person. He is not a good person. I also like that the moments that glorify him, since it's all from his point of view, he seeks yes. that glory. Yes. So the moment he struts down those stairs is when he has found the glory in being evil. Yeah. So the movie glorifies an evil man being evil because right. he's telling you the story. So yeah. for me, the way the narrative structure of the film wrote its own answers, it always solved the problem that I keep reading about because to me, it does everything to tell you like, hey, don't be this guy. Right. And it keeps like reminding you like his life's horrible. I mean, him killing that psychiatrist at the end is horrific. Mm -hmm. And that's the final nail, I think, that Todd's like, no, do not cheer for this guy. And as I said before, and real quick, Scors uh, Coppola did not want you to like Michael Corleone after The Godfather. Yeah. He was mad that the fandom, the fans, movie lovers loved Michael Corleone. So he made him even more vicious in the second film. So you'd really hate him. And Tyler Durden is the interesting interesting villain. Yes. Well, there's an interesting separate conversation to be had yeah. about the idea of what we depict and what we glorify in movies yeah. when it comes to things like Fight Club and things like Godfather, uh, where it is sort of, it is, very difficult to argue that you watch The Godfather and the people in it don't seem cool because of course they seem cool. Mm. It's a movie centering their perspectives and like watching their downfall in a beautiful and thoughtful way, but giving space to them and putting their cent stories front and center. Like th that's a separate argument that I'm pretty interested in about yeah. like which things are depicting and which things are glamorizing. Mm. And even Scorsese over time is, is as he gets around to other things like when he makes Wolf of Wall Street, is he depicting or is he glamorizing? Yeah. Is casting Leonardo DiCaprio DiCaprio inherently glamorizing because it's very hard to look at that guy and not be like, right on, you know? Real glamorous, that guy. <laughs> Which feels bad because it's like I'm not trying to take acting opportunities away from Leonardo right, DiCaprio. Right, right. But that's an interesting sort of question. I don't know. My basic take that you mm. you know from talking last week is that I unfortunately, or what I feel is unfortunate for me is that I refreshed a lot of the influences right before watching this film. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the way that it drew from its influences for me mm -hmm. became a distraction. Uh, and I love that I saw some of what you said on Twitter that you felt like it really took those influences and remixed them into something of its own. Yeah. And I, I sort of, I would like to have gotten that out of it, but I had a different experience with Fair it. Fair point. Um, yeah. And it, it, you know, that was the 
that's sort of the line for like, but you know, I'm I'm thrilled that like they took a chance on this material, that it's being yeah. met with success in this way. Uh, it just things that played as cool, unreliable narrator tricks in some cases. I and I like that kind of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. There were moments where it played as trying to have it both ways for me, where it then resulted in not adding up to something. Mm. Uh, taking a series of moments and aesthetics that don't necessarily like, I guess it might be that like, maybe I am more leaning on the screenplay aspects or the resultant screenplay mm -hmm. aspects of what we got. Uh, but like, again, like I said last week, I like the cinematography, I like the performances, yeah, yeah, yeah. but things to me like, uh, I, for me, one story element that was, that didn't work the most was the ZZ Beat storyline. Right. Um, because it, it, I am usually a pretty easy mark for falling in love with characters and their stories. And the, the reveal of what, that that had been in his head, which does go along with the storyline mm -hmm. thing, I think didn't maybe hit for me the way it should have for this film to be its most effective. Oh, uh, okay. Um, because... It would have needed a different kind of buy-in from me along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and I've talked to some folks about it, uh, and I, I, I'm curious what other people's reads on it are, but uh, you know, you want moments like that to break your heart. And uh, I had oh. been sort of I, having a different experience of being like, huh, this is sort of odd. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes away from the power of the reveal for me well, in that film. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I guessed it from the second time second scene with them and I was like oh this is all in his head isn't it and I was just, I'm like hoping that it's all in his head because it seemed very clumsily done but I don't think to you're your supposed point. to hope that it's in his head well uh, yeah, that's fair but I, I, like you said different experiences yeah, like yeah. for me that's what I, I knew I was like okay this is in his head a God, or God I hope it's in his head because I, that would be clumsy filmmaking by Todd if it wasn't mm. and then when the reveal happened I was like yeah that makes sense and whatever there were some people though who reacted pretty loudly to the reveal who were sitting behind me mm. uh, who didn't think it was done that way and I, I was shocked by that I, but I had another take I hear your point because it also reduces ZZ to just an accompaniment a, a com accompaniment to the situation rather than a fully fleshed out character on its own with its own, her own storylines and her own narratives, her own push. Well, and then there's the different takes on like, what do we think happens to her and how do I feel about not knowing? I'm fine oh, not right. seeing Good it, point. but I'm not sure how I feel about not knowing. Yeah. But uh, it is Joker's movie and it's his perspective. Yeah. I was afraid she was manip manipulating him mm. uh, when they when she came to the doorway and started like, oh, this guy's crazy. And she was like, I'm about it. I was really afraid that it was going to be a Zazi is the one that pushes him over the edge by not liking him anymore. Mm. So I'm actually glad it was that twist because I didn't want her to be like the evil woman that breaks the Joker. Because the last thing I wanted was the like, then Harley becomes like a kind of a, a parallel to how he felt like. So mm. the fact that she was imaginary made me like, oh, that's a relief. It's not evil Zazie. Mm. So right. for me, I never saw it as a negative because it was a relief. So I can see what you're saying. But since I had such a strong like, yay, she's not real. That worked for me. Um, and overall, like, the, what it was able to make me feel is unlike anything I've felt in a movie. So, like, it, I, I don't like roller coasters because I get sick. I get motion sick. So when I get off a roller coaster, I'm like, why do people like that? <laughs> this, to me, was like, oh, I feel awful. Oh, I love that. So it was a really interesting... I don't go be, I don't self-flagulate. Like I don't go out to be upset, but I've seen this movie three times and every time it's upset me. And I think that's really interesting art that you can make something like, you don't eat food that's spoiled. You don't watch car crashes, but this movie is putting you in a position to be like, I don't like this experience. I want more. Mm -hmm. And I love that art can do that because I've never experienced it. That's beautiful. John, final thoughts? Uh, I, I say it's a film that you have to savor and enjoy. I totally respect if you don't, if it's not your cup of tea. That's what great art is. Sometimes you don't like it. Sometimes you do. There are people who hated Picasso, too. Like, this is how it works. And I'm not saying it's Picasso. I'm just saying. <laughs> any, any piece of art that people have arguments about, to me, indicates that it's an art that is worth uh, uh, paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And I think this is... And one last thing. Sometimes pushing the genre isn't comfortable. And this certainly in my opinion push the genre this is the first film that in my mind when i saw it i was like i could see this winning best picture and this the all the other ones i would hope they would win best picture but this is the first one that when i saw i was like this has all the elements of a standard best picture type winner that could do it i don't think it will obviously now in retrospect especially all the controversy but that's what i would say and that i think speaks volumes and it should be a positive overall effect because now that this can be done maybe something a little more savory for a lot of people that still has these elements can be done in the future that a lot of more people will enjoy 
I'll happily agree that I hope it opens the door to different types of films in yeah. the comic book uh, medium and in the superhero. Uh, I said comic book medium, and I, it's a genre. It is a medium, not a genre. Never mind. Yeah. You had it right. I, I had it right the first time. <laughs> uh, I love artistic chances. I, I hope we get a lot more experiments that aren't just attempts to duplicate this. Uh, and yeah, thanks for coming on the show, John. Thank you. I, Where can I appreciate people find you on the internet? Yeah, you can find me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you're in Orlando this Friday or Saturday, you can see me competing in a particular event about movie trivia live. Ooh. And he's got a cool bat related guest on the deep cut. I'm just That's, saying. Uh, I'm, I'm just, just saying. saying I mean, slight nudge possibly you know, happening bat related. Is. Also, give us that sweeping romance Mr. Freeze movie. If you want to follow up Joker, give me that Nicholas Sparks Mr. Freeze. I want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are going to let Koi rest. I pushed it a bit because we were having too much fun on the there's no one to stop us because the producer is here. It's true. <laughs> and he said the F word. Until next time, <laughs> stay, stay sweaty. sweaty. I said Fig Newtons. <laughs> <laughs>